Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. We're excited that you've joined us. Our topic today is the Kubernetes maturity model. Are you crawling, walking, or running with Kubernetes? Today's webinar is sponsored by Fairwinds. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'll serve as your host and moderator. A few housekeeping items. We are recording the webinar, so all participants will receive an email with a link to the recording and slides that we'll share with you. We also are giving away four gift cards at the end of the webinar, so stick around to find out if you're one of our winners. I know that our speakers today really enjoy questions, so I hope that uh, you will ask questions. So let me get right to our topic, Kubernetes Maturity Model. And I'll turn it over to Kendall and Sarah from Fairwinds. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Mitch. Well, welcome, folks. This is the Kubernetes Maturity Model, as mentioned. Um, this is something new that we've been working on at Fairwinds. Sarah has been pulling, pouring a lot of heart and soul into, so we're excited to share with you. Um, and we'll go through introductions here and tell you a little bit about who we are and who Fairwinds is. But uh, Sarah, you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. Welcome, everybody. My name is Sarah Zelahusky. I'm the VP of Engineering at Fairwinds. Uh, I am responsible for the engineering team here and um, one of the creators of the Kubernetes maturity model. And my name is Kendall. I'm president at Fairwinds. Um, I've been here about five years, had just about every title in the company except for engineer because uh, I haven't written meaningful code in a very long time. So um, anyways, we're excited you're here. And uh, before we say more, let's stop and do a quick poll so we get a feeling for where y'all are in your journey. So if you could answer this, where are you in your Kubernetes journey? This will help us frame a little bit of how we get into the discussion going forward. Um, and we've got about 35, 40% of you voting. Keep them coming in. We'll leave it open for a little bit till we get a little bit more in and then we'll close it up and I'll talk you through the results. And we'll do about 10 more seconds. <clears throat> All right, and here's the results. So it looks like about 50% of you still just learning about containers and Kubernetes. 25% have spun up a test cluster. 4% have started using it in production. 17% that using it in production, I guess that, that line's a little bit small. And only 4% uh, would identify as a Kubernetes expert. And you can go ahead and take the results off here. And we'll dive in. That's helpful context for us as we talk about this. So um, this maturity model is intended to ex be useful to people at any point in their Kubernetes journey and hopefully helps you understand where you are and where you're going next. Um, so real quick, by way of introduction, who Fairwinds is, um, <clears throat> we are a Kubernetes enablement company. All we do is help people succeed with Kubernetes. And we do that through three primary means. Uh, we have a services model, build and maintain Kubernetes-based infrastructure for people. So a lot of people, like 50% of you, are just learning about containers and Kubernetes. And uh, you've heard this is a buzzword. You've heard this is the wave of the future. You could go solve it all yourself. Or you can come to a company like us, Fairwinds, and say, please make my problem go away. We build and maintain that infrastructure for you and help you succeed with it in the long term. We also have a whole bunch of open source in this space because we run Kubernetes at macro scale for so many different people and companies. We see what are the issues that everyone's running into and then we write tools to help us solve those problems and release them for open source to the community. So everything from um, security tools to uh, things to help you get resource requests right to CI, CD, lifecycle, or application lifecycle tooling. We have a whole bunch of open source that addresses all kinds of different things in this. And then finally, um, we do have a SaaS tool as well. If you're dipping your toe into Kubernetes and you want to know how to do it right, um, I would argue this paradigm of Kubernetes is intimidating because uh, it is a whole new paradigm. So if you want to get it right securely, efficiently, and reliably. Um, we have a SaaS tool for doing that called Fairwinds Insights. So go check out fairwinds.com. We've got a, we've got something for you wherever you are in your journey. Um, and that's why we're the ones talking about this. Is This is all we've done for, gosh, it's been 
uh, almost five years that we've been just a Kubernetes company. So we were a little too early to Kubernetes. When, when Fairwood started doing <laughs> Kubernetes, the market wasn't quite there yet. But uh, so, yep. Sarah, you want to introduce the maturity model that we're getting into today? Sure, I'd love to. So a little bit you need to know about me is that I actually started as an engineer before I went into leadership and management. And so I actually started out my own Kubernetes journey in the trenches along with all of the technical people who were trying to make this work. And so I had the privilege and pleasure of helping many new companies and many new people walk through their Kubernetes journey. And so when it came to um, trying to discuss the Kubernetes journey outside of Fairwinds, outside of the company with people who had never um, been able to wrap their head around it or who were just getting started with it, I really wanted to come up with a way that we could explain the journey in its entirety so that people could understand what they would go through on the journey. What phases would they experience? What challenges would they experience at each phase? Um, you know, what was the benefit of getting through it? Uh, if I get stuck at a specific phase, who can I ask for help? Um, you know, if I am churning at a specific point and I can't mature past that, you know, how do I break that barrier? And so, you know, if you look out in the in the world today and you try to see like what is my kubernetes journey going to look like there's a couple different paradigms that exist out there but a lot of the time right now people focus on this day zero day one day two paradigm which is fine right each day represents a large phase of your transition but they don't go into detail about what you're going to experience in each one of those days and often it feels very reductive when you're talking about it. And it's not super helpful to somebody who's trying to do the work on a daily basis. So the Kubernetes maturity model was really developed to be more comprehensive, to dig down into the details and say, this is what you're gonna go through. It's perfectly normal and fine. And here's some resources you can tap along the way. And here's how we can walk you through the journey. And it's helpful to know where you are so you know how to get to what's next, what to consider and what's next. And also not to panic that like, I'm not far enough along because everybody has to walk before they can run. Um, and we have another poll we're gonna throw up here real quick. What is your biggest Kubernetes challenge? Oh, uh, well, let's do this one. Well, we, we need to come back to this poll. Sorry, <laughs> Jay. Um, can we not do this poll and do the other one? Is it too late? What's it too much? Okay, well, it's okay. We, you just, just guess on where you are in the Kubernetes maturity model, and then we'll talk you through. We, we meant to launch this one at the end, but that's okay. Um, so take a guess on this, and then when we're done, we can maybe go back and look and see where you are again. <clears throat> this will give us good intel about how well we've named the different phases. Yeah, there you go. So we have about 40% responded, a couple more people. Uh, vote and we'll wrap up here. Oh, and we'll go ahead and close it in about five seconds. There we go. That was a quick five seconds. I'm sorry. This is me trying to communicate too with the folks around the poll in the background. Okay, so where are you in the Kubernetes maturity model? We have uh, about 50% of you just in preparing, 13% um, in transforming and deploying, 17% building confidence, 13 in improving operations, and 8% in a measured in controlled or optimized and automated state. So um, <clears throat> that doesn't surprise me. That about lines up with where I would think folks are. But you can go ahead and close that and we'll keep going. So uh, this is what the Kubernetes maturity model looks like. And we're going to be breaking this down phase by phase as we go. But anything you want to say about this uh, picture here, Sarah? Sure. So I really love this visual. It's uh, a very brief overview of the content that we're going to go through deeper, like Kendall said. But I think what I want you to get out of this graphic, and I want you to revisit this later if it interests you, is that there are many phases along this journey, right? It is a long one. And I think a lot of people don't give that enough credence. There are many phases that you're going to go through. Don't let it be overwhelming though. Um, the great thing about this model when you get into it is that you can go through this entire uh, stepped process with one application or all your applications and services, right? And you may loop back and there's no phase along this journey that is bad or good or you know needs improvement, right? It is just a phase of your journey that you will step through. And so as you go through that, um, you know, just think about where you are and where you want to go and how that might apply to your situation. 
All right. And uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So phase one, prepare. This is where the vast majority of people are um, sitting down saying, hey, like I said, hey, I've heard there's this buzzword, Kubernetes, it's a thing. Um, where do I even get started, Sarah? And is it, should I go buy five Raspberry Pis and spin up a cluster? Is that step one or what, what do I think about at the beginning? Yeah, it's a great question. It, it depends a lot on whether or not you're an individual or, or an organization, right? If you are an individual, five Raspberry Pis, or a watch, a smart watch might be a really awesome project to take on. But if you're a company or an organization, there's a lot more preparation that you're going to have to do to make sure that you can take this on. The first thing that I really want people to understand about phase one is it's going to be overwhelming, right? There's so much information out there, but some of it uh, is very um, low level or high level, I guess I'll say. There's not a whole lot of content there. You will struggle to find the right information that you're looking for. Does Kubernetes apply to my specific use case? It, are my apps and services architected well to work within Kubernetes? Um, do I have the right staffing to be able to take this on? How much time will it take? How much money will it take? These are all the questions that you'll need to ask as a business to then be able to say, yes, Kubernetes is something that we would like to invest time in and try. And it's really all about that. It's prepping yourself and making sure you all have, have all the right stakeholders lined up. Because I can tell you from experience, the companies and the organizations that will struggle on this journey are the ones who don't take the time to think about whether or not Kubernetes is a good solution for them. Uh, you'll see jokes in the Twitter sphere about how you know people are putting their personal blog on Kubernetes. There's a lot of reasons for that. But I think uh, what it's trying to get at is not every problem needs Kubernetes. Kubernetes is wonderful for a lot of things, but just make sure that you think about it ahead of time. Yeah, man. Getting getting started with that and even knowing where to go. So I would also point out that um, you know if we see 50% of y'all are still in this prepare phase, I think that that's pretty representative of the market. Adoption mm -hmm. of Kubernetes is going to be this hockey stick, and we're right at the very beginning of that lift still of adoption. And so it's sometimes hard to even know where to go find good resources on this because there is a lot of people writing about their prepare phase and. Uh, the vast majority of the information is not being written by companies that are succeeding with it in production at massive scale yet because so few organizations are that far along. Um, well, let's dive in. So you've decided you have done some preparation and you've decided this is something that you do wanna do. What's next? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the second phase is what we call transform. This is actually where the bulk of your work can happen, right? This is an IT transformation. It is taking something that you already have that you've ostensibly invested a lot of time and resources into, your business, and translating it into a completely new technology and new framework, right? Um, companies take this two different directions, I think. You can either use transform as a POC, as a proof of concept, where you're saying, okay, now that I know enough about Kubernetes, I think this is gonna be great for us. Let's spin up a cluster. Let's uh, try to put one of our applications inside and let's try to prove to ourselves that this is really, right? So you can use phase two as another proving ground for yourself. And I think that's a really great use. The other way is to jump right in with both, both feet, right? And say, we're gonna take what we have and we're gonna transform it into something that can work well within the cloud native landscape, right? And there's a ton involved here. This is where this is what makes or breaks people, I think, with Kubernetes, right? Um, you have to containerize your applications, which generally means you'll often need to 12-factor your applications. Um, once you do that, you have to decide, okay, I need a Kubernetes infrastructure. Do I use a managed service provider? Um, do I use uh, managed Kubernetes from one of the cloud providers? Do I do it myself? Uh, what are the trade-offs there? You then have to work on build and deploy, which is getting those containerized applications into Kubernetes. Only then you can start playing with things within Kubernetes and saying, how does this work? How do, will it actually benefit us? So this is a lot of learning, a steep, steep learning curve, a lot of trying to figure out what's going to work for you, a lot of trying to look out there in the cloud native landscape and say, like, how I put all these pieces together. And it's overwhelming for sure. Um, this is the one that most people will need assistance with or will spend a lot of time in. Yeah, even because you do have to even spin up a cluster and start kicking the tires before you have any feeling for what it looks like. All the preparation in the world, uh, you know, is different from actually getting started. And right. um, 
and this this is part of that is you do have to at some point start dipping your toe in at some point start making business decisions around how you're going to uh, transform things so mm -hmm. um, okay well so then we we move on to phase three deploy now there's you know we've got our application containerized um, We've started to fiddle around with this. We have some things stood up and we think we can start to use it, but we need to actually shift some of our applications into that. Um, what does that look like, Sarah? So phase three is kind of like, I'm up and running. I love to use that term, up and running, right? I've got my application packaged up in a container. I've got a Kubernetes infrastructure running, whether or not it's a POC or my final product, and everything's working right? Magic. Um, but now, like, now that you've got things working, uh, you're still going to be learning, right? This is where people often are like, oh, it's Kubernetes is just going to be magic. And once I get to this point, all my problems will be solved. Unfortunately, that's not true. You're still a beginner, right? And you should not be afraid to be a beginner. This is where you start learning the difference between knowing a word like a pod or a deployment and understanding what that actually means in its manifestation right, where you can start playing with things. How do I kill something? How do I start it back up again? How do I scale something? Um, and really start just getting your bearings. Things are gonna feel weird here. They're gonna feel slower than you want them to. Um, you know, teams may struggle uh, to actually utilize Kubernetes in the way that they thought they were gonna be able to. So this is really about like, now that you're moving forward on the bicycle that you're riding, you're a little bit wobbly, but you're still moving forward, right? That's the way that I think about this phase. So we have a question that came through about the business case for Kubernetes and, and can we, do we create business cases for Kubernetes? So depending on what you're asking there, Fairwinds is happy to help you make a business case for Kubernetes if that's a thing that uh, you want. Feel free to get in touch. We're happy to help you pitch that internally. But to that point of you're on your bike and you're riding a little bit, Sarah, you're starting to see, hey, riding a bike is actually pretty nice. I'm going to be able to go faster than I walk. Um, you know, talk about what what is that that the business starts to see as some of the, you know, maybe later on there's some real clear business outcomes, but what are some of the first business outcomes that, that people will notice or, you know, for the use case? Yeah, yeah, great question. So I think the thing about this deploy phase is that you have to have all the pieces in a line uh, and they're all working together to get to this phase, right? So you push code, uh, that code is built into a container, it's deployed, and then it starts being live in Kubernetes. And so you actually have a very smooth working uh, deployment pipeline really is often what you get at this phase. That's a really great business outcome because historically, um, you know, that hasn't been as easy with other sets of technology. And so now you've got maybe dev and ops teams working together well in that DevOps dream and you can push code more often, right? That's, that's happening. Um, and also you, Kubernetes, by its base function has a certain amount of self-healing capability right so it's gonna tr it's actually gonna keep you up and running more reliably and more stably than other solutions with with the standard defaults right so i think you're gonna see a little bit of that benefit in these early days where yes it's still slow and awkward but i'm actually benefiting from kubernetes i can tell you a story um, you know, very early on, I had a customer that was up and running with Kubernetes in about phase three, and they went through their first AWS outage, um, you know, where US East one or probably went completely down. And Kubernetes actually, because it had self-healing across availability zones, kept them up and running. And it just worked, right? There is that level of default management that's happening you can certainly go further in other phases, right? But I think you're gonna to start to see some of that magic peeking through. You can get from one place to another, right? <laughs> well, the legacy things, I mean, back when you had a data center and you were in charge of orchestrating all of your own servers and something went wrong, a lot of times it required a human to show up and literally flip a switch off and flip a switch back on because let's be honest, that's how all tech problems are solved, where um, <laughs> Kubernetes is doing even just that piece for you, you're going to notice business value pretty quickly. And yes, there's the cloud and other things that do this, but Kubernetes is making a lot of this easier in the cloud native world. Um, but I think that's a, a great point. And I like even the image of I'm on a bike moving and I'm starting to see some value to that. And yes, I'm wobbly because I don't know how to ride a bike very comfortably yet. I'll get better over time, but uh, that's, a, that's a great image. Um, okay, well, let's... Yeah, that's right. Um, so you've been riding for a while. Now it's time to build confidence. And part of building confidence is just doing it a whole bunch. And um, 
maybe, well, talk a little bit about this, but then I'd like to hear some of your stories of some of the things we've learned the hard way and uh, and some of the confidence building that comes from falling off your bike and finding out you can still sure. get on and keep going. Sure. Yeah, so that's exactly what phase four is. It's building confidence. And what does that mean? Um, using it on a daily basis, right? Forcing yourself to go through your daily business using Kubernetes and you will find all of the edge cases, all of the sharp edges um, and all of the things you don't yet understand. And that's okay because that becomes your learning opportunity, right? Um, why is this application keep failing in a crash loop? You know, and you have to look into it. You have to figure out where do I find events and logs? Uh, how do I restart this thing? You know, how do I change the configuration to make sure that it doesn't do this again? And by forcing yourself to dig into the everyday functionality of uh, your workloads working in Kubernetes, you're actually practicing these skills and you're using the language and you're building a more nuanced uh, vocabulary. The great part about phase four is the experimentation. Maybe you feel confident enough riding your bike now that you can do some like weaving around objects. Um, maybe you can hop off a little curb, you know, who knows? But like feeling like you can test some of these things out and um, you may fall, you may not, and like being okay with that. Um, yeah. You I will say- be, You have to be on the bike before you can even attempt trying weird things on the bike. And you have right. to be riding for a little while in a straight line before you can even go over the object you're wanting to try seeing if you can go over. Um, right. And that's part of this phase. What were you gonna say? Yeah, Sorry. I was gonna say, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna sign up for like the Red Bull, you know, bike jumping championship or whatever it is before you get to this point, right? Um, I mean, I think, you know, my experience at Fairwinds has been that the reason that we, companies come to us as Fairwinds or as Kubernetes experts is because we've literally been building confidence in phase four for five years, right? With every customer that comes in our door, they're using Kubernetes for a different use case. And so by helping them on a daily basis, uh, try to make sure that their workloads are stable and reliable and efficient, we are building confidence in new things. A big thing for us was like just becoming confident in being able to do Kubernetes version upgrades during the regular business day. Like how do we de-risk that? And how do we feel like if it goes wrong, we can recover from it? Um, you know, and I think that it's honestly the best way to work and one of the benefits I think of customers coming to us is that we can inject all of that learning into their, you know, bottom line so they don't have to fall on their face a bunch of times. But um, this is a really empowering phase where I think a lot of people will finally feel like they understand Kubernetes and can do cool stuff with it. And with external help, you can save yourself a lot of the confidence building troubles, right? I mean, to, to go back to this bike analogy, if somebody says, hey, here's how you go off a curb. Hey, here's how you go over a bump. You should probably lift your butt off the seat. You know, those kinds <laughs> right. of things that make a little bit, little difference, but uh, you not having to learn that the hard way is a big deal. And um, even one, one example I think of from our early days in running Kubernetes is when we were still figuring out what tool we were using for the network overlay. And um, we kept running into these weird problems and we couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And we started to narrow in on it as it would continue to recur. And, you know, I almost mm -hmm. think of like, if you're learning to ride a bike in isolation and you've never talked to somebody else who rides a bike and you, you keep getting off your bike and noticing that your pants are cut, cut at, the, you know, <laughs> at the pant leg and like, what is going on? And you have to do it about 20 times before you realize, oh, when I wear pants and I'm in this situation, it catches on the chain ring and rips the pants. You know, I mean, I'm, I know I'm carrying this analogy a really long way, but still, uh, I think it's I think it's that kind of thing. And, and like, you sort of have to make the mistake several times and go, oh, this is what's going on and I can, strap my pant leg up with a rubber band or stop, mm -hmm. you know, only wear shorts when I bike or whatever it is, that's the solution. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway. Exactly. Okay, so improve operations. So we've built some confidence. Now we feel like we can do this. We've been through some fires and come back. And uh, I mean, I recognize in that build confidence phase, if you're not far enough along in Kubernetes that when something goes wrong, you totally panic and you go back to whatever you had before, uh, you're less far along in this model, right? And so now you've been through that confidence building phase. You've had some mistakes and you've recovered from the mistakes and you feel like, okay, this is an environment we can learn in, we can recover from. 
um, and you've moved on a little bit, and now talk about this improve operations. Now we can start to ask bigger questions about getting things better from here on out instead of just surviving, kind of, right? That's right, that's right. So up until now, you've been kind of trial and error, right? Like um, trying to make it work and trying a couple of things to help make your life easier. But now you've gotten confident enough where you can start specifically tackling some of the problems that you have or some of the issues that have arisen since you started using it. And I think phase five is where it really starts to that that business value that is sold, you know, in phase zero of Kubernetes, where everybody wants to be able to scale to huge heights and to be able to get increased efficiency and reduced costs and all these things. Phase five is where you actually start to see that, in my opinion, uh, because now you can say, okay, I have this workload and historically we've scaled it by CPU usage. And so what we've got like 150 pods running of this API server and it's costing us a bunch of money. How can we look at that specific problem and use Kubernetes, its configuration, its strengths uh, to actually improve the operations, reduce the cost, um, you know, do we need to scale on a custom metric? Do we need to set the limits differently? Um, do we need a different node type, right? These are where you start to dig into, now that I know the Kubernetes vocabulary and I can uh, understand and grasp, and maybe I have some resources that I can tap into to dig a little bit deeper. Now I can tackle these specific problems that I want. So it's generally around um, reliability. How do I get these clusters to be solid as a rock? How do I get every deployment to work flawlessly? How do I get this application to, you know, be resilient when it dies? That type of thing. Or, you know, how do I now make sure that not everybody's an admin on my cluster? Like those types of things. I think. <laughs> you, it's. I laugh, but I know that that's happened. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's part of it is you have to because it's such a new paradigm. It is like riding a bike if you've never ridden a bike before. And it just feels different. Once you get comfortable with it, you're comfortable with it. But if you've never ridden a bike, it's very uncomfortable at first. And once you've gotten pretty good at it and you can start to really optimize, I mean, this is when this is when you're comfortable enough on your bike, you're not worried about hopping a curb anymore. You're starting to tweak. I wonder if I lower my handlebars a little bit or change my gear ratios or start to you know, um, put different pressure in my tires. How does that affect my ride? And mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think I like the way that you put it, that it's when you get here that you start to really realize some of those business outcomes. But I think it's also worth noting that like somebody giving you a really quality bike back at phase one, if you're talking to people who've been through this the hard way, you can get a lot of this business value a lot sooner because you don't have to learn all the lessons the hard way and get to a point where you finally have capacity to ask the questions. You can ask some of the questions out the gate. You can have some of the default configuration built right out the gate. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's normally in phase five once you've been through a lot of falling and standing and getting back on the horse or bike, as the analogy continues. Um, <laughs> okay, um, mm -hmm. are you ready for the next one? Sure. sure. So measure and control. Um, yeah. So so now everything's up and going. What what are we measuring? What do we care to control? Um, and what shouldn't we be measuring? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So these last two phases are very nuanced and very advanced. Um, and like I said, you don't have to do all of your apps and services phases one through five before you get here, right? If you deployed early on in your POC an app or service and it's been through the learning process, you can get to phase six relatively early, right? Um, so don't feel like you need to wait to practice some of these things, but it is a very advanced section of the journey where now that you can operate, everything up until now has been instinct, right? Or practical, functional uh, exercise where you have learned things by doing them and you come across bumps in the road as you find them, right? Phase six is really about let's get ahead of the curve let's start doing things before they become an issue or let's start measuring things and collecting data so that I can get ahead of things. Um, so measuring the first half of it is a lot about, okay, now that I, I know Kubernetes in and out pretty much, right? Like how can I collect the right amount of data to get me uh, the knowledge that I want about my apps or services functioning well within there? 
do I know how I can un like measure the resource usage of a certain workload? Do I know how I can calculate the cost of a certain workload? Do I know um, when a certain user takes an action on my website that it causes an infrastructure failure on the back end? Like this is where you get um, logging and monitoring and observability. And you may have had basic functionality of those things earlier on in phases, but this is when you really start getting more advanced measurements around what's happening in your cluster business intelligence and that type of thing. The second half of this is about controlling that, right? So now that you have data, now that you know what your system should look like and how it's happy, let's start locking that down. Let's start making that um, just regular everyday behavior, right? So um, now that I've had my whole team using Kubernetes and deploying to Kubernetes, maybe I want my developers to be able to push to development and staging, but not production. Maybe I want only, you know, my SRE team to have access to production. Maybe I only want bots to be able to deploy, right? This is really about starting to, because you now know so much about riding a bike, it's really about saying like, what is my brand of riding a bike and how do I do it? Um, and uh, so this is really where you start taking control over how you do Kubernetes, I guess I'll say. Yeah, well, and it's and it's controlling what can become a rat's nest of Kubernetes. I think when people right. think about this change, the average person's thinking about it in a mid to small size company where there's probably going to be a handful of clusters that can mostly remain under control. And definitely in the enterprise, what ends up happening is that's how it starts, right? They start with a few clusters, build out more, you know, we, I've talked to a few recently that allow any developer anywhere in the organization to spin up, spin up a Kubernetes cluster to fiddle with and to deploy things into, and some of it goes straight to production. And like, all of a sudden you have this rat's nest of Kubernetes everywhere. And how do you control that? And um, I mean, along these lines, one of the questions that came in is, what do you suggest to bolt on to give more observations with operational Kubernetes? and um, Boy, howdy, am I glad you asked that. And we got a piece of software for you. So, um, I mean, this is what uh, Fairwind's SaaS product does see, seek to solve. And I'll put this in, I answered that in the question up there, but um, I will put in the chat for the whole audience as well. This is Fairwind's Insights. So if, um, if you need to enforce policy at scale and you want great policy out of the box, as well as security checks and all kinds of things related to the, the health of your deployments and cost um, monitoring, et cetera, Fairwinds Insights does all of this and also includes the ability to write custom policy to enforce across your organization. So you need insights, at, you need insight into your clusters at scale, use Fairwinds Insights. You need to enforce policy at scale that's what this exists to do as well. So um, it is like, there are other tools out there. A lot of it's open source. A lot of what we've done in this tool is gather open source and mix those together um, to, to bubble up the highest priority things. Um, but it's hard to do at scale if you don't have some kind of tool that helps. And that's part of the reason that we had written this. Um, mm -hmm. Anything more you'd say about that before I move on? No, I think that sums it up. Okay. Um, and so then let's get into, you said this is nuance between six and seven, talk about the nuance and what is optimize and automate and how is that different from measure and control? Optimize and automate is kind of the pinnacle of um, Kubernetes. And I say that because pinnacle to me, like if you're thinking about a pyramid, you know, the, the little block at the top is the smallest. Right? Like that is when you get into the tiniest tweaks that are going to make a, a small yet powerful difference in the business value that you get out of Kubernetes. So when you're getting to the top of this, um, you, you mostly have everything under control. You understand what's happening in your clusters. You, um, you know, have a good workflow. Your team understands how to use the system that you've built. Um, but all of that up until now has been very much human driven, right? And we know historically the movements in the last, I guess I'll say like a decade, have been toward automation and have been toward removing human error and removing human toil from systems of technology, right? And so phase seven is really about now that we 
have such good practice around what we're doing and we we're happy with where we are. Um, let, let's automate the heck out of this so that our humans don't have to manage all this complexity on their own anymore and they can get back to managing business problems, right? And so this is really about, now that I have systems at work, um, let me double down on infrastructure as code so that if my clusters break or you know AWS availability zone gets blown up that I can um, recreate clusters easily or that if a change goes out that broke something, I can revert it very easily. Um, so that's what the automation portion of this is. It's look, let's reduce the toil on our employees. I can tell you from experience because I run a team of Kubernetes SREs, it gets really boring at phase seven, right? You're doing the same management and maintenance you're upgrading Kubernetes, you're upgrading add-ons like cert manager, like external DNS. You're, you, there's a lot of the same activities that you'll have to do over and over again to maintain the system that you've built. And what you wanna try to do then is solidify that into code and make sure that it's repeatable. This also protects you from single point of failure problems. Uh, historically, I've seen a lot of companies get into Kubernetes really deep and then lose that one person who built their system. Right. Um, if you can get to the point of automating that human being's everyday tasks away, it's not as scary for your business if you have staff turnover or if you grow your team. Right. People can kind of just pick things up much more quickly. The optimized bit is now that we've got insight into that measurement from phase six, now that I know let's say this one workload and its behavior over time and how much resource usage it's using. Like, let me just be able to tweak that on a regular basis and let me build some smart systems to be able to scale that, um, you know, and like I said, just you're just tweaking the knobs uh, all that much more. And I know Kendall already gave a plug for Fairwinds Insights. Fairwinds Insights does give you the single pane of glass into all the information that you've collected up through phase six. So now you've got all of this data in one place and it allows you to have a prioritized list of all the things that you can tweak in phase seven, which is a really powerful thing, right? As you get more in clusters and it's all spread out and you know maybe you do have control over it, but it's still overwhelming to say, are all my clusters up to date? Do all of them have the same version of cert manager? Are all the workloads being deployed consistently? And so optimizing that, getting that, all those that those data points into one place so that you can then start tweaking is really important and insights does that really well yeah okay yeah and i would i would just add um you know early in the phase of our company we we had t-shirts that said on the back of them automate all the things and this is really the phase where you're getting to that and i know operators love to automate everything love to automate themselves out of the job um and kubernetes it can be done with kubernetes you have to get pretty far in your maturity model to get there, but you can have it so that your developers from a git commit to running in production, uh, it is fully automated and everything is built and scales and manages um, all of those pieces without a human needing to be in the middle of the process. And like Sarah mentioned, removing those single points of failure so that uh, the automation is running things instead of a person that might leave your company is a really big high priority for the business. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, can, I say well, one more can I say one more thing? Yes, yeah, So we just talked through phases one through seven, and you might think now that you're at phase seven, like why don't we just automate from the beginning? I don't, I don't want you to think that you can't automate to the end, right? But this maturity model, the way that we've built it, represents a common journey that we've seen people follow over and over again with our exposure to people trying to to pick up Kubernetes. So this model is a model of a common everyday journey that people go through over and over again. So this is um, not an ideal necessarily, right? Where I'm saying you need to be secure out of like day zero and you need to automate right from the beginning. You can, right? Um, I think there's a lot of pressures on a business or a company, a lot of priorities that are different that may lead you to not be able to do that, to not be able to go slow and automate from the beginning. Not to say that you can't, it's just not common in my experience. And so I want you to think about it in that way. It's not saying like leave automation till the end. It's just saying we've seen most often that when people get to a certain maturity level, then they're ready to do this well. Well, they have capacity to do it. If they're spending time fighting fires or just trying to figure out how to 
get everything moved over from the old paradigm, they don't have the capacity to do it. Yeah. Um, okay, well, so um, we already did this uh, poll, but we're gonna go ahead and do the poll again. Where are you in your Kubernetes maturity model? And we've had a few people that have joined uh, since we did it the first time. I'm also curious now that we've gone through it, if people's answers change. So we'll see if we get that pulled up. Um, yeah, go ahead and fill this out now that we've talked through it. See if you think you're in a different spot. Um, and then uh, we'll have some time for Q&A here yet coming up and then do stick around till the end. There is a drawing for a, a gift card is my understanding at the end here. So um, you can go ahead, 20 more seconds, we'll wrap up the poll. You can go ahead and put questions in the question box there. Um, we will try to get through all the ones that come through um, depending on how many come through. Um, and uh, about 10 more seconds. And we can go ahead and wrap up. Now let's see if this looks different from before. Mm -hmm. And it does, look at that. So uh, now we have 36% at preparing, 36% at transforming and deploying. So maybe maybe people realizing they're somewhere different than that uh, structure than they thought before we shared those details. 20, 23, almost a quarter of you in the building confidence phase, which is good. Mm -hmm. That's encouraging to hear. Um, mm -hmm. And 5% in the improving operations and uh, nobody into the later stages, but that makes sense. Anything you want to say on that, Sarah? No, that's great. Um, I'm glad that people can have been able to kind of narrow down more where they fit. And it's awesome to see people really trending toward that middle, which means they're not as early in the journey as maybe they thought they were. And hopefully that feels um, invigorating to them. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so now what? So, I mean, we have this Kubernetes maturity model, Sarah, and uh, I can look at it, go cool, 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 or I can leverage it somehow. What's what's What should I do with it? Yeah, so my main hope for this Kubernetes maturity model, um, we just announced it this week, it's relatively new in the community, but I really want it to gain traction as a way for us all to talk to each other about where we are in our journey. Because I think when we can start to articulate where we are, we can start talking about the right topics. As I mentioned and Kendall mentioned, right now a lot of the information out there is phases zero through two, right? Um, and that's fine, there, there, we, there's a lot of help that's needed at those phases. But what happens when you get to phases three through five, three through seven? Um, a lot of the time you're then on your own or you struggle to find information or help in those areas. And so I'm hoping that as a Kubernetes community uh, or market, we can start using this as a basis to communicate with each other. And also I want people within companies to be able to use it to communicate to each other. Um, you know, if you as a implementer, a DevOps person or an SRE or somebody responsible for Kubernetes initiative, I want you to be able to go to your executive or your C-level and say, this is where we are. And this is why, you know, it's been taking as long as it has or why I need more budget from you. Th that type of thing I think is really important. Um, and it'll allow you to focus on where you are and what you're learning and maybe not feel as um, isolated or as behind as maybe you think that you have been. Um, and then, you know, for us as a company, for Fairwinds, who interacts with people that are, starting their Kubernetes journey or partially through their Kubernetes journey and they want help, they want managed service, they want software, whatever it is, it's a really great basis for us to be able to start a conversation. And we can say, well, where are you? And what are your current struggles? And then we can kind of pair you to what type of assistance you might need or what resources that we can um, you know, redirect you to. And uh, we've done a really great job. Our marketing department has put together a website on the Kubernetes maturity model, which hopefully all of you have either gotten the link to or will after this presentation. There we go. Good segue. Um, I would encourage you to go to this website and dig into it a little bit more. Um, you know, we gave a brief presentation on it, but hopefully this will allow you to see yourself in a phase and say, oh, that's the one thing that I've been struggling with that I can't communicate to my boss. And um, you know, start exploring some of the resources that are available to you wherever you are. Um, you know, start a conversation. I think that's bottom line. Okay. So we've got a bunch of questions coming through. So I'm going to try to get to uh, as sure. many of them as we can here. So um, one of the first ones that I think is interesting is: um, Are there stages where people tend to struggle most or get stuck in the in the model? 
Great question. So in my experience, I think phase two is really dangerous. Um, if you take on too much all at once, this is the transformation stage, I think is what we called it. Yes. Um, if you take on too much all at once, it can be very overwhelming. If you try to transform 30 microservices from EC2 Ansible deployments into Kubernetes, you're absolutely going to feel overwhelmed. It, it's going to take you longer than you expect. And um, you know, you might not be able to justify the time to your boss and you might end up quitting or whatever it is. Um, also phases um, three and four are a little bit dangerous in a certain way, which is if you made decisions in phase two for one application, you're gonna notice in phases three and four that maybe you made the wrong decision. Um, maybe you didn't leave yourself enough room uh, you know, t or enough, like you didn't configure things properly to support the rest of the apps that need to come in and you're going to have to go backwards a little bit. Um, so these earlier phases are definitely challenging because of the complexity, um, because of just the limited experience that a lot of folks in this field have with Kubernetes. I will say that there's another interesting sticking point after phase five-ish. Um, at phase five, you're going to feel really confident. Um, you're going to be able to tweak things and experiment with things. Things are going to be mostly stable. Um, a lot of people don't even push themselves to get into six and seven. And that can be okay. Um, but it also can be dangerous in a certain way because you're leaving all of the control, all of the insights, all of the uh, optimization, everything that you wanted in the business value that somebody sold you in phase zero, um, you're going to leave that all on the table. Uh, and so phase five is one of those things where like don't let yourself become complacent. And then the last thing I'll say is that phases five, six, and seven are going to be a cycle, I think, um, from what I've seen is that you will likely go through five, graduate to six and seven in certain topics, and then loop back around and have to start experimenting again. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, Gosh, a whole bunch here. It's hard to know where to start. So a couple of these are just questions about what our services look like, and I'll address a couple of those, and then we'll get back to some higher level questions about tools and such along the way. So uh, one of these is, do y'all also support multi-cloud Kubernetes implementations? And uh, the quick answer of that is, it depends on what you mean, but uh, yes, we build, we build and maintain Kubernetes infrastructure in all three major clouds. Um, in theory, you can do it elsewhere, and uh, we are not hands-on with those environments. Um, the only place that we build and maintain and actually own that, that part on a managed service side is in the three major clouds. Um, if you want to run a little bit of your infrastructure in all three clouds, we have repeatable processes for making that as easy as possible. What we don't do is federate across clouds, uh, and that's because federation is still something that looks really cool on paper and doesn't work really well in real life. Um, so I hope that answers that. Uh, assuming I'm already containerized, how quickly could Fairwinds typically get a customer running in production? Um, do you want to answer that, Sarah? Sure. Uh, there's a little bit of nuance here. So Fairwinds, the way that we build infrastructure for customers is that we have a default stack that works for what we think is a good 85 to 90 percent of use cases. And if we were able to build you a cluster with our defaults and they meet your needs, uh, we can typically get you up and running within four to six weeks. Um, it can be very quick uh, if you're already containerized and 12 factored. Any deviations that you need from that might change that um, estimate, but it really is kind of a case to case basis. Great. Um, and then how does working with a Kubernetes company like Fairwinds help you accelerate through maturity? I mean, you, it's it's like taking lessons on learning to ride a bike versus pulling out, you know, an old mangled thing out of your garage and trying to see if you can make it work. Um, it's going to save you a lot of time, energy, and probably knee scrapes. Um, it's also like having a Peloton that you ride with on a regular basis, right? And people can give you advice and you can see how they do things and you can tweak your behavior based on that. Um, just having that support, you have that in the Kubernetes community at large, but also um, you know, you're not paying people to do that. And so it's harder to get their attention and you have to you know, wait on their time scales, whereas Fairwinds can be available to you quickly and regularly. So here's one that says, have you seen greenfield projects differ from legacy and how they follow this maturity model? I think that's a great question. 100%. Um, greenfield is generally 
much easier and can transition through the phases uh, much more smoothly. That's because there's no preconceived notions about uh, what the architecture needs to look like, um, what the the language that's caught up in your head about how you do things. Um, and so generally greenfield projects are very accepting of new terminology, new methods of doing things are much more flexible as you get through the phases and things need to change. Um, and often it actually is cheaper, right? Because if you're starting in Kubernetes, you're only supporting one environment. Um, legacy projects are really challenging in a lot of ways. Um, containerization for legacy projects is hard in itself. Uh, then transmogrifying that into Kubernetes architecture that works and makes sense can be challenging. Changing everybody's cultural and language, uh, you know, patterns to support Kubernetes and like that inflexibility can be really challenging with, uh, with older projects. And so in that case, it's just a lot slower, I think, um, and get, they get stuck in the earlier phases for a lot longer. Yeah, I mean, it's it, like, um, like with anything, if, if you're starting from scratch and it's a clean slate, it's, it's really teaching an old dog new tricks kind of thing. If you're 60 before you ever learned to ride a bike, it's just harder than your mind. It's less elastic maybe <laughs> than if you're six when you're learning, right? Uh, in theory, you'll learn it a little bit faster and falling will hurt a little less um, in theory. Um, Okay, uh, apart from your own tools, do you have an opinionated stack of other tools that are required to get to phase five and six? And um, we do actually have a uh, whole thing put together called Fairwinds Elements that is a whole bunch of our, our open source tools, other open source tools that we think are the necessary add-ons to go from click button, get Kubernetes to actually production grade Kubernetes. Now, granted, Every one of these tools requires configuration, and the configuration is really the hard part. Kubernetes is easy, configuring Kubernetes is hard. Um, and so you're gonna want help with a lot of that probably. Um, but uh, do you have anything more to say about that, Sarah? Uh, you can find Fairwinds Elements on our GitHub, is that right? Yeah, we also have it on our website, which I will drop a link in both places again for that. Yep. So there's a cohesive list of all the tools that we use. Like Kendall said, some are ours, some are uh, open source tools in the community. And they cover most of the bases, most of the functionality that we see that most people need. Like Kendall said, um, there's a lot of legwork still in there to put them together and make them work together well. Um, but there certainly is a list that we try to stick to. Yep. Um, and let's see, we've got we got a few more and we'll need to wrap up before the top of the hour here. So I'll try to move quick. Um, let's see, yeah, wouldn't it be better to start with some new cloud native apps rather than move into modernization of current applications? Sure, if, if, if you can throw away everything and rewrite your whole stack and do it cloud native, <laughs> yes, but you probably can't, you're probably going to need to move things. Um, well, and the nuance here is that, you know, we actually recommend a lot of our customers to start with their easiest app. Um, because it will be less painful and you will learn a lot along the way. And those learnings can translate back when you finally do get to your Rails monolith, right? So not to be like too flippant about it, that is a really good idea um, if you can do it. Right, yeah. Um, how does your product work with on-premise solutions, OpenShift, for example? So I don't actually know about OpenShift specifically. In theory, any Kubernetes based infrastructure can run Fairwinds Insights. Now that's that's our software product, which is what I'm assuming you're asking about. If you're hiring us for services, we build vanilla Kubernetes. There's nothing proprietary about what we build. Um, but if you're if you're leveraging our software for success with that, any Kubernetes based thing will work. It doesn't matter if it's Rancher or GKE or EKS. I don't know enough about what's different in OpenShift to say for sure that that would work. Um, that's actually interesting. I can go back and ask. Do you know? I know our, head, our development team was working on OpenShift uh, implementation, slightly different. I don't know currently what the progress of that is. Okay. Um, and let's see. What is your view of OpenShift and Rancher? Um, so OpenShift and Rancher, this is all express my view, and you can add something here if you want, Sarah. Um, OpenShift and Rancher are a lot, very different, first of all. Um, Rancher in some ways is for standing up and then managing the life cycle of Kubernetes with a fancy GUI instead of all the CLI tools. Uh, OpenShift is much more, OpenShift is a wrapper around all, all of the Kubernetes things 
and it's very much Red Hat following the same model as a Kubernetes as a Linux distribution. So where with Linux, there's the kernel and all Linux is kind of the same components, but there's a million different distributions. That's basically what uh, Red Hat did with OpenShift is tack on a whole bunch of opinionated add-ons to give you all the things that you need. Um, and if OpenShift works for you and you wanna pay Red Hat for that, great, but there is a blessed version of Kubernetes where there was never really a blessed version of just base Linux. Um, there's you know the blessed kernel, I guess, but you really had to have a distribution to get from kernel to usable Linux. Um, you know, Rancher's a great tool. If you need to spin up a cluster somewhere and use Rancher, Rancher makes that easy. Uh, it's it's going to be vanilla Kubernetes underneath the hood, which is one of the advantages there. Um, mm -hmm. We we leverage things like EKS and GKE and um, AKS in the clouds because they're using vanilla Kubernetes under the hood, and um, that still works. So. Um, yeah, that what's my what's my view? They're different, solving different needs. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, I would my personal opinion is leverage vanilla Kubernetes because the people who try to sort of fork it or wrap things around it end up in trouble as the community moves in one direction and they have to try to keep up. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, whew, that's a whole bunch of questions. I think. We need to wrap up. Do you have anything else you want to say, Sarah? Otherwise, I can turn it back over to the DevOps.com folks. And um, if you have more questions or we didn't get to your question, please do reach out. We're happy to address them um, offline or uh, put you in touch with somebody who can answer the question. So, um, yeah. The only thing I'd love to say is talk about this. Um, talk about it with people that you're talking with Kubernetes about. Uh, get it out there so we can start using it as a shared language. And um, we're always open to feedback on it as well. You know, what are your experiences with it? How have you gone through it? And is it different? And what should we be thinking about? Thanks. And Mitch, we'll turn it back over to you to wrap things up. Awesome, awesome. You know, I love the maturity model. Really uh, fantastic work. And uh, as you said, it gives a great frame of reference just for us to be able to understand the journey that you're on. and. You kind of don't know what you don't know yet until you get into those things. So the fact that you've codified that, kudos, kudos awesome. to uh, Fairwind. Appreciate you contributing that to the industry. So we do want to close up here. Thanks everybody for your questions. And of course, thank you to Kendall and Sarah for a great talk, presentation, discussion, all of the above and uh, fielding questions as well. We want to close out with a couple of things, just a reminder that we are sending an email the link to the recording and the information about the maturity model. And uh, so it's free to download. You can also point folks to the replay and on demand. So that's available as well. We do have four gift card winners, $25 Amazon gift card winners. Those are Betty W, Mark C, Glenn E, and Andrew T. I feel like I'm practicing my alphabet today. So <laughs> the folks at uh, DevOps.com will get a hold of you about uh, receiving those gift cards. Well, thank, on behalf of Kendall, uh, Sarah, Jade, myself, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun uh, listening to you both and learning from you. And uh, you know what? You, everyone who attended spent a whole hour with us. That's a lot of time. And we're honored that you would spend it with us. We hope we've uh, entrusted that hour well and delivered a lot of value. So thank you for joining us. Be safe, be well, and be careful out there.